Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth and final panel session of the Race Before Race Region and Enmity Interdisciplinary Symposium. My name is Sylvester Cruz, and I am a PhD candidate in the English department at Rutgers, New Brunswick, as well as the graduate representative to the Race Before Race Region and Enmity Symposium Organizing Committee. It is my pleasure and my privilege to serve as the moderator of today's panel session. A few notes before we begin. Uh, we do offer live closed captioning transcriptions of all of our panelists' presentations, and this option is available at the bottom of your Zoom window. For those of you who are active on social media, we invite you to connect with us and join the conversation on Twitter via the hashtag race before race. We also invite all of our participants in the audience to contribute questions for discussion via the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window at any time over the course of today's panel presentations. This panel is entitled Contextual Migration. I'm excited to introduce our three speakers, Christina Richardson, Ren Chuan Ma, and Kelly Nguyen. For the sake of time, we must gracefully pass over formal introductions, but I do want to let our audience know that the bios of our wonderful speakers are available for your perusal in the conference program. Dr. Richardson's presentation will open our session, followed immediately by Dr. Ma, then Dr. Nguyen, with a Q&A dialogue to follow. At this point, I'd like to pass the mic to our first panelist, Dr. Richardson. Would you care to take us away? Thank you very much um, for the introduction and for, uh, for attendees. Thank you also to Arizona State University, to the Race Before Race board members, and to the Rutgers uh, Planning Committee for hosting this innovative conference and um, yeah, just allowing this conversation to take place. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I've shortened my handle um, to Romani Egyptian and medieval biblical iconography. So I should say I am a medievalist of the Islamic world, but some of my work on Roma in the Middle East has taken me into actually Bavaria. So uh, join me as I, as I kind of wanna chat a little bit about what's going on. So as for um, the Roma, we find the clearest record actually of Roma entry in in the imperial registers of Sigismund, uh, the King of Hungary and Emperor of Germany. So on March 13th, 1417, um, while he was seated, uh, while he was attending the Council of Constance, two petitioners, both male Christian converts from Islam, who hailed from the Islamic Orient, the Islamic East, approached the king. Um, so at the Council of Constance, a convocation of archbishops, bishops, and deacons to resolve the papal schism, um, these two layman petitioners either approached King Sigismund at the um, Cathedral of Constance, where the council regularly convened, or at the nearby Augustan um, monastery, close to the lakeshore, where the king was staying as a guest. We don't know. Uh, much about what he was actually doing, but we do have some record in the official register um, of what was happening on March 13th in Kornstein. So the implied subject of this record is the king, and it says, you know, transcribed here in German, that he gives the Duke Michael, Herzog Michael von Egyptum, so uh, Duke Michael of Egypt, and in Galite of Schutzbrief, so a letter of safe conduct and protection. So through King Sigismund's letter um, to, King, to um, Duke Michael of Egypt has not been preserved. It technically struck um, a, a familiar note of welcome, right? That, that he also gave to um, another gentleman, as you can see down here, um, to whom he recommended um, to all of Christendom that this convert, this Muslim convert named Bartholomew, et cetera. Okay, so although we don't have a record of that letter, we do have, and I realize this is, you know, more than 100 years later, later but Sebastian Münster in his Cosmographie, uh, Grofia, um, has a summary of safe conduct letters he said that he saw uh, carrying in his land. And it says here that the letter told how their ancestors in Lesser Egypt, so in the original Latin of Münster, in Minori Egypto, had formally abandoned for some years the Christian religion and turned to the error of the pagans and that after their repentance, a penance had been imposed upon them that for as many years, um, some members of their families should wander about the world 
and expiate in exile the guilt of good sin. So as you can see, um, Duke Michael probably um, presented himself as a Christian convert, right, from Islam, um, since at the time, right, a pagan would have generally signified a Muslim in Latin Christendom. So identifying as a foreign penitent certainly had an air of plausibility, for the city of Constance lies along the way of St. James, a network of pilgrimage routes that spans Western Europe. And of all the parties that an, in, you know, an ordinary person would encounter on the road, um, such as minstrels, messengers, masons, peddlers, tinkers, beggars, friars, and runaway serfs, the wandering penitent was among the least threatening and most revered of these possibilities. So it was one of the acceptable reasons for people to be mobile. So the same pilgrimage route um, would easily have taken um, the penitent directly onto the city of Augsburg, um, where later in the same year, in 1417, so recall they get there in 14, you know, in March. So um, a local anonymous chronicler in Augsburg um, recorded the arrival of so called Egyptian light, so Egyptian folk, um, on November 11th, 1417, which was also the fe a feast day, St. Martin's Day. And he writes that they were bearing letters by which they might steal from anyone who gave them no alms. So, I mean, we could, in, in the letter probably said something more that, you know, that, you know, as per protected people under um, King Sigismund's, you know, under his protection, that they should be entitled to all this. But, um, but anyhow, <laughs> this chronicler is in, in, interpolating his own um, interpretation. So we cannot know if this particular group in November in Augsburg was Duke Michael's group. Maybe it was a splinter group from his, or maybe it was an entirely new company of Roma. But however, um, whoever they were, we do know, you know, they're, you know, they're the, the records of these Egyptians in what is today Germany, you know, continues to grow. So sometime between September and December of the same year, 1417, 1470 is really a wat watershed year in uh, Romani history. Um, a similar group led by a duke and a count had reached the Baltic Sea coast. So Hermann Proterus of Lübeck in his Chronica Novella of 1435, published later, but in which he states that in sometime in this, this period, um, he, he notes that people, you know, a mass of people numbering about 300 men and women, not including um, the miners, right, had actually, you know, come to his Baltic Sea coast town. And he writes that they were ugly in appearance, black like Tartars. They called themselves Pekanos. They also had chieftains among them, that is the Duke, and account. And this, I mean, and so that must read a bit familiarly to you, I hope, heard about Duke Michael. But as you can see here, in this, in this um, you know, there's a lot he writes in the middle. He writes about, they have a letter from King Sigismund and other princes, he says. But he also very interestingly writes that the reason for their wandering and traveling in foreign lands is said to have been their abandoning of the faith, Christianity, and their apostasy after conversion to paganism, the South. They were committed to continue these pilgrimages to, in foreign lands for seven years as a penance laid upon them by their bishops. So the script for black life uh, Tartars, as you see here, that's a racializing, a racialization presented in terms of resemblances and affinities. The Tatars, T-A-T-A-R-S, were a Muslim people, formerly of the Mongol horde, but at this time living in Crimea. And as you probably know, as I'm speaking to a crowd of um, medievalists, in the 13th century, Domingo, the eponymous founder of the Dominican monastic order, planned to travel to the steppe to convert, um, you know, the Tatars and the Kumans to Roman Catholicism, but the trip never came to pass. But I say this just to state that there was an awareness of this, you know, Muslim, perhaps darker skinned community um, in, you know, what is it, Eastern Europe. So comparing these Black Egyptians to Black Tatars positioned these new arrivals as an outsider race and an outsider faith, even though they claim to be Christian. But it is striking that racialization actually happens in writing. And that's obviously, as I'm going to show you, in visual representations of the Roma. Um, 
I should also add, um, I underlined seven years here. It's not highlighted in the original manuscript or the print, uh, the original printing, but it's it's interesting because it mirrors the seven years out of Egypt that, that they say they have to spend is the reverse, as you may already be thinking, of the Holy Family's seven years sojourn in Egypt, right? Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, according to stories in the medieval Meditationes Vitae Christi. Um, so, and also just to keep in mind, um, before setting out on pilgrimage, right? Medieval Christians typically received blessings from their local bishops and their pilgrimage could serve as a form of penitence. So as you can see, um, whether or not these little Egyptians and these Sekanos understood this idea of pilgrimage and consciously adopted this stance as penitent pilgrims, making their cultural estrangement legible to local indigenous European Christians is as Geraldine Hang says in her work, um, an ex it is an extraordinary process of successful cultural translation by the Roman. I think you know, this is actually a really insightful point, um, how we can actually, they seem to have been quite aware, you know, the statuses that exist in society, ideas about penitence, pilgrimage, um, and also resonances with the Christian stories. So circulating as penitent pilgrims, they discovered that they made their way north. Duke Michael of Egypt's group could have reached the Baltic Sea coast by September, as we've seen, um, you know, in a trail that moves again from the far south, from Constance up to the far north of the Central European plan. So the thing to know themselves as well, Sikanos ties their background to the Ottoman Empire, um, where two words were common Ottoman Turkish terms for Roma and Roma-like traveling peoples. One is kipti, which you hear in the word Egypt, kipt or kopt, or Egyptian, right? So that's the Ottoman term for Egyptian. And chingani, which you might hear, I mean, you know, it's the sort of um, molding of it to say chinganos, chingani, chinganos. Okay. Um, so whereas I think in a lot of historiography, it's been assumed that these Romani groups coming into Central Europe presented false identities as Egyptians. I feel it is more likely that they were translating Ottoman terms into German and into Latin. And so from 1417 onward, right, mentions of these Egyptians and these Sekanos proliferated in Egyptian town archives and diaries and chronicles, notarial registers, you know, parish registers. And in 1417 and 18 alone, our Egyptians, as I'll call them, appear in Hungary, in Bohemia, uh, Mecklenburg, uh, I think it's kind of covered up with this thing, uh, Hannover, uh, Holstein, Switzerland, Provence, uh, Colmar, Strasbourg, and, and Saxony, as we see here. So, um, you know, it's, it's, they, they move pretty quickly. And again, this is just in 1417 and 18. So, what I have found interesting um, and what I wanna show you today is also how the Roma, men, women, and children have been integrated soon after their arrival in Central Europe. So you see here, this first one I'm showing you is 1423. And you should recognize, of course, I'm saying this more for myself than for you, uh, but for Mary, Jesus, uh, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, they all have halos. Um, you might be able to decipher a pseudo-Arabic um, script inside of their halos, and that these two maid servants were behind them, of course, um, right? There's actually some pseudo-Arabic on her sash, and she's wearing a flat turban. So you can see that they're delineating these biblical people, right? They're understanding them as being of the Orient, um, the so of the East, um, and, and they're kind of marking the space through this Arabic writing. You can see here. And this very particular configuration of the family I want to um, talk about because I think I have in it, uh, I think I have found um, a woodcut actually of, well, of the Holy Family depicted as Romani people. But anyway, just to make sure that we're familiar with basically the, the iconography, I wanna talk about it first, right? This flight into Egypt iconography, this, this is a mid 15th century example. Um, Flemish, but you can see Joseph as an aged man, you know, leading a donkey on which Mary and Jesus with their shiny halos, right, are, are processing. And the direction in which they're moving, this is not the strongest part of my thesis, but I think most of the examples I'm finding as they are flying, 
uh, fleeing into Egypt, they are moving towards the right of a page, right? Um, so, so here, which put, brought to mind for me, at least, you know, the TO maps, it seems, we'll talk about that, that they're kind of positioning the Holy Family as European and they're moving into, you know, Northeast Africa, into, into Egypt. Okay. And here's just obviously another example of these scenes. So now everyone's familiar with this iconography. So before I show you what I think is, a, you know, sort of an, um, an allegorical portrait of this family, I wanted to talk about briefly um, what are the standard representations of these of our Egyptians. Sometimes they're called little Egyptians, right, in, in minor Egypt. So the men are wearing striped garments. Um, the women have various characteristics. They're wearing flat turbans. Very characteristically, they're knotting a piece of cloth a cloak at one of, at one shoulder. They're typically carrying babies. They have bare feet, and their children have pierced ears. So uh, there's. I invite you to you know visit an art the work of an art historian who has worked on these topics. But I wanted to carry his analysis a little bit further to talk about racialization and and other things. So in 1435, again about 18 years after the Roma first make a very clear and and um, impressive appearance in Central Europe you have this painting and you can see two Romani women in the crowd. So the flat turban, as you see here, um, carrying a child. And here's another rope. Um, you can't see the cloth tied at her shoulder, but you can see that this white sash would be tied here. And here, um, another Romani woman, flat turban, knotted cloth. So this is the picture that I felt. Um, this is a print uh, from the Upper Rhine Valley between produced between 1420 and 1450 uh, with some watercolor um, wash here and currently in Baumschweig. Um, but what you can see is the directionality is the opposite of the dominant um, flight into Egypt iconography. These are Egyptian, these, oh, I mean, I will argue these are Egyptians fleeing Egypt, right? And coming into Europe. So on this, you know, they're moving towards the left. She has the knotted cloth um, at her shoulder. Um, she's carrying a child, but um, what really um, distinguishes her, right, is enough by this, um, I guess, tonsured man leading the donkey, but that, you know, um, she's riding side saddle as so many representations of Mary Show. She's balancing a basket of chickens on her head and an infant is in a cradle on her knees. The ends of this large cloth are tied over her right shoulder and behind the cloth bulges uh, her behind her, the cloth bulges, excuse me, with the roasting cage and bellow. Um, so again, this large knot is a was a widely recognized sartorial feature of, li of um, little Egyptian women that artists reproduced and chroniclers noted throughout the 15th century. She's using both hands. She's busy. She's using both hands to actually spin wool or flax on a spindle and distaff. And the speech bubble above her reads, "Ich heiße Mess und Muss." My name is Busy Body. So this wood cut, which art historians have thought to be one of the earliest known cuts of a profane subject, was in fact, I argue uh, today, inspired by Christian iconography of the Holy Family's flight into Egypt. Now the Holy Family represented a righteous poor trio, right? But our Egyptians representing the antithesis of a model Christian life enacted the reverse journey, burdened with all of their junk of a household and leaving Egypt as impoverished wanderers and suffering the pressure. So this encounter in 1417, I believe, did force European Christians to reimagine a biblical past that accommodated the existence of these of these Egyptians, ultimately constructing them as the ultimate strangers, non-Christians, in spite of what they said they were, and racializing them right outside of outside of Europeanness. So racial hierarchies, of course, found biblical justification. Um, I don't have to repeat that, but right, Noah's sons were thought to be the progenitors of every race on earth. But our Egyptians escaped this taxonomy and came to, in a, in a way, and came to represent any generic heathen. <laughs> um, so 15th century artists began incorporating features of these people um, to represent um, people of questionable moral character, namely women and Jews. So we'll see here in this scene, um, again, 1420, just note the dates right close to um, their arrival. You have um, Mary Magdalene, right, washing or touching the, the feet of, of uh, the corpse of Jesus. 
um, as he's being buried, and um, she has her flat turban. I'll just go quickly through some other. They, in 1430s, again, here's Salome, right, who participated in the, or somehow in the beheading of John the Baptist uh, with her flat turban. Um, you know, she's represented a, a wicked one, a, a morally suspicious person, to say that. And this one, if we focus, and I'll pull up a detail for the next slide, but if we focus on this upper right of this triptych uh, by Dirich Butz, uh, that's today in Leuven, in St. Peter's Church, um, well, first, let me let me give you another description of them so that you can see, you know, what I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the description I've given you are replicated uh, throughout sources. So nearly all of them, meaning all of these Egyptians, had their ears bored with one or two silver rings in each. The men were black, their hair curled, the women remarkably black, all their faces scarred, their hair black, their only clothes a large old shaggy garment tied over the shoulders, as we've said. In short, they were the poorest, most miserable creatures that have ever been seen in France. So in this upper right corner of this triptych, right, we have Romany dress and decoration uh, in, this, in, in this biblical portrait of Israelites who are collecting manna, right? So the flat turban, the cloth at the shoulder, the child with an earring, right? The board ear. So they're, they're, they're in, the, you know, the artists are reimagining biblical Egypt as a space that had to accommodate um, these, um, these new arrivals to, to Central Europe. Here's a detail from a very large and beautiful painting, but of Saint Veronica, right, displaying the true icon, the Vera I Christ. Um, this is a little bit later, this is 1478, but I wanted to zoom in on this woman here. here. Sorry, this woman here, and you can see her flat turban, um, and you can see another, you know, another uh, companionate woman. It appears, right? They're both holding very young children. They both have a particular style of dress in which this cloak, right, is going over their shoulders. It may not stand out a lot for us as modern viewers, but right, look at Veronica's clothes and look at uh, this this woman pulling on the on the true icon, right? And we also have, you know, very much later in the 15th century, Albrecht Dürer's Turkish family. Um, so, you know, there's sort of an overlap with Roma and Turks and, and Muslims, essentially, um, the knotted, the turban, the child, the bare feet, right? All of it comes together, again, with uh, Martin Schungauer, um, a tapestry, um, also, you know, from Flemish areas, right? You have you can see another Roma woman. Um, you can see her bare feet, the child, the knotted cloth, the turban. So in this, she has all of the characteristics, right? That um, Pokorny, the, the art historian has identified. And again, a companion um, who's apparently here pulling something out of this nobleman's pocket. That's also another motif. Um, so these are not, these particular images are not themselves of biblical Egypt. This is another, this is again, a, much later, this is 1510. Um, and if, you know, it's um, a tapestry hanging today in, in uh, New Hampshire. But if you look at the top right, it's a, it's a hunting scene. I won't go into describing it too much, but you see this man is blowing the horn to start the hunt. But what's happening at left is that this Egyptian family is coming into, you know, this, um, this lordly, into the space of the lordly manor. And I'll zoom in on um, a couple of people. Well, actually, maybe I should zoom out. So you can see actually on this horse, right? There's a woman not at her shoulder carrying children led by a man. It's kind of like the holy family imagery. But I wanted to focus on this woman and then this older woman. So here she has a flat turban, the, the knot, the baby, the bare feet. And her child down here seems to be pulling, you know, the purse of this mortally dressed woman. And behind this woman is another uh, Egyptian woman, right? Well, again, with a knot, and she's older, you know, an, an elderly woman, and, and with a kind of differently shaped turban. And she's holding her hand, presumably to tell her fortune. Um, a lot of sources tell us. This is just the last one I wanted to show you because this is again getting back to biblical imagery, and then I'm going to um, wrap it up with just some commentary. Um, 
but you can, this, the title, right, is the Sermon of St. John the Baptist. Of course, here he is sermonizing. And, and it's, you know, it's a Flemish painting, obviously. So you see they're, they're you know, who's in this? Nobles, priests, soldiers, peasants, burghers. You know, it's, it's supposed to be kind of European. But you have a Turk. Uh, there are Jews in the audience. And if you look here at this span, the only person actually turned, well, aside from the, the actually the, the Egyptian child, but the people turned to face the viewer, right, with this audacious gaze is um is this man and he's marked by his striped garments um his part you know his companion here um you know the, the the headgear is a bit different but of course we're looking at 1566 this is no longer 1417 but i just want to say that over time right you you keep um artists maintain uh, the presence of roma in these paintings but as you can see he's also the one not paying attention to john the baptist so so he's <laughs> he's someone who's epitomizing um epitomizing anti-Christian behavior. All right. Um, so medieval Christian observers made sense of these newly arrived uh, foreign Egyptian Christians by mapping them onto familiar um, biblical stories about, again, Jews as religious outsiders, women as sinners, and the Roma kind of fully encapsulating that. Um, so to conclude, I suppose just to analyze this a little bit, um, and I, I want to hear your comments, of course, in the chat. I, I, no, I'm sorry. After after we after the panel, um, so the Roma figure clearly, as as I've mentioned, in town archival records, in chronicles, registers, and other sources where their racial presentation is fairly standardized. The men are black. The women are black. Um, they say they're Christian, but you know, but something, but they're compared constantly to the Tatars, right, who are living um, in Eastern Europe from the formerly, you know, uh, the Golden Horde, right? This former Golden Horde, they've settled there even after the Mongols had retreated. So, so they're comparing them to these so-called, well, to, to the to the black peoples, as they're calling them, who live on the step side of their region. Looking at paint. Um, you can see that the Roma are differentiated from indigenous Europeans through dress, body modification, in placing Roma back in Egypt, both in biblical antiquity, right? Antique Egypt and all century Egypt. Um, the United the Egyptians, their claims to piety, to Christian affiliation, and especially to Christian. So in this sense, the racialization of peoples from the Orient and Muslims in particular, right? But they're also including Jews um, and everyone else. Uh, the Roma are unfit to be Christian. They are unfit to, to, to claim this, of course, to receive these letters. And, and to be in their land. And the project of converting Muslims, right, um, to Christianity is doomed. So not that crusades should not be actually enacted, but that, you know, that maybe some sort of compassion and mercy as part of the Christian project of conquest, domination, you know, taking back Jerusalem, et cetera, the holy city, that this is incomplete, you know, Conquest is the only way to actually deal with this. These are people's incapable of actually entering into the Christian fold, all right? So it's a racialization that, that has implications for morals and also um, for belonging um, in 15th century Europe. Okay, I'll stop there, but thank you so much for your attention. Oh no, you're muted, you're muted. Thank, thank you, Christina, sorry. Friday afternoon. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone from Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm Ren Chuan Ma. First of all, I'd like to thank um, the Race Before Race organizers, uh, Patricia, Leah, and their entire team. Uh, thank you, Sylvester, for moderating, and thank you my, to my fellow panelists, fa fellow panelists for their uh, fascinating presentations. Uh, so my talk this afternoon, let me, excuse me, let me um, share my PowerPoint. Second. Okay, oops, there we go. So my talk this afternoon 
uh, will focus on the concept of region, specifically how the prestige associated with medieval manuscript, medieval European manuscripts shift, evolve, and take on new dimensions when these artifacts are, uh, when these artifacts and the texts that they contain travel beyond Europe, outside their more usual cultural, historical, and institutional settings. As a case study, I will discuss the only known medieval manuscript of European origin held in Taiwan, Taipei National Taiwan University Otori 299, a 14th century French manuscript that contains two texts for moral instruction. The Book of the Night of the Tower by Geoffroy de la Tour Landry, known in French as Livre pour l'enseignement de ses filles du Chevalier de la Tour Landry, and the French verse translation of Aesop's Fables. The manuscript has a storied mother provenance that I have pieced together with the help of rare book librarians on three continents. Uh, bought at auction by a minor English by minor English aristocrats at the outbreak of World War I, sold to a family of Japanese diplomats in the mid 1920s, acquired in Tokyo in 1929 for the founding collection of the research library of the new Imperial University in Taiwan. For a bit of historical context, Taiwan was ceded to Japan after China's defeat in the Sino-Japanese War of 1895, and it remained a Japanese colony for 50 years until the end of World War II in 1945. National Taiwan University was founded as Taihoku Imperial University by the Japanese in 1928, and it changed its name to its um, current name in the, in the late 1940s. I will focus on the Japanese and Taiwanese portions of Otori 299's provenance. And in doing so, I argue that these circumstances reflect wider Japanese cultural alignment with Western colonial powers and imperialist practices. The manuscript's purposeful acquisition by an imperial university suggests an interest in imposing Western culture and forms of knowledge, in addition to Japanese political and cultural authority as a marker of colonization. Just a quick disclaimer, sorry, a quick disclaimer about terminology. As we know, Western is a problematic term, but since it's Chinese equivalent, Xifang or Xiyang uh, is common parlance for referring to European American um, influences. Um, and I'm going to use the term as a simple descriptor for that reflects this cultural attitude. But more importantly, I do not wish to treat the wide ranging provenance of Otori 299 spanning European, East Asian, European and East Asian countries as incidental because doing so would, doing so would uh, lessen the, excuse me, lessen and undercut the unique significance generated by considering these very circumstances. I've put up on the screen a definitional provenance from um, uh, Clemens and Graham's introduction to manuscript studies as a counterpoint uh, to the idea of, to the idea and the implication of provenance that I wish to uh, present today. Instead, I invite us to actively interrogate and uncover the afterlives of this manuscript and the texts contained within it, and allow this information to broaden our understanding of the cultural interest in and the impacts of medieval manuscript culture. In what way does Otori 299's provenance and perhaps other medieval manuscripts with similar um, cross-cultural, cross-national histories reshape, even expand our understanding of medieval manuscripts and the multivalent interpretive vectors that they can encompass? Otori 299 has not been mentioned in scholarship um, on medieval book history, apart from the descriptive catalog of the Otori collection published by the uh, NTU Library, National Taiwan University NTU Library, and then notice on the Arlima database for medieval French literary texts, which appeared shortly after I presented on this manuscript um, at Kalamazoo in 2019. Mm -hmm. Nor has the manuscript ha been included as part of existing critical editions of either of its constituent texts. In other words, the very existence of Otori 299 and its potential scholarly contributions have not yet been fully explored or acknowledged. Its context, colonial institutions of higher education in Taiwan, Japanese modernization, perception of Western structures of knowledge, provide intriguing unconventional circumstances for manuscript studies and book historical lines of inquiry. What happens to our understanding 
of medieval texts and their manuscript settings, as well as our approaches for critically interpreting medieval material culture and its afterlives. While these are perhaps unexpected circumstances in which to consider a medieval manuscript, they reveal readerships and interests that are wider than those typically, typically expected of medieval French institutional instructional texts, excuse me, a glimpse at how these medieval texts become sites for intriguing cross-cultural encounters. To situate ourselves in the manuscript setting, I'll begin with a brief paleographical and cortical overview of Otori 299, and then, and then looking at bibliographic and historical information, examine its position in the context of the Otori collection and the rare book acquisitions of Taihoku Imperial University, or now uh, NTU. Oops. Otori 299 is a 14th century manuscript containing in order uh, the Book of the Knight of Tower and Aesop's Fables, with a blank leaf of parchment separating the two works, indicating that the two parts of the manuscript were produced separately, apparently with different teams of scribes. Uh, and at some point, at some later point, post-medieval medieval era, bound together. In general, the contents of both parts are written in a neat secretary hand with some cursive features with the scribes for the Book of the Night of the Tower uh, having a somewhat more even and regular aspect compared to the scribes for uh, the fables. Uh, the script is not of the highest grade and lacks the more, the more kind of elaborate flourishes and more disciplined and upright aspect of book hands from this period. But the evenness, of, the evenness of appearance and spacing suggests a good degree of care in the scribe's execution and presentation. The degree of care is further indicated by the presence of a now defaced um, illust opening illustration and consistent use of decoration on to, decorated initials, excuse me, to indicate internal textual divisions. So you see the, um, I have an uh, enlarged version of the um, opening illustration here. And you can see an example of the alternating colored initials here. Notably, Otori 299's fly leaves uh, reflect a multitude of bibliographic interests and receptions spanning several centuries in at least two continents. Provenance information appears in four languages, French, Italian, Japanese, and Chinese, and it provides us with a sense of multi-layered readership and cultural exchange. The information in Ch Chinese and Japanese, which you see on the screen here, represent the manuscript's most recent provenance and appears in the form of accession stamps for the Library of Taihoku Imperial University. There is an oval stamp bearing the regnal date Showa 4331 or March 31st, 1929. Um, Showa 4 meaning the fourth year of the Emperor Showa or also known as Hirohito. And the formal seal, uh, square shaped and stylized with traditional Chinese characters that represents officials uh, library, uh, sorry, the library's official seal. And so in terms of the uh, colonial encounter and the geopolitical intersections of the, that we can kind of get at through this manuscript, um, it's this manuscript, Authority 299, stands at the nexus uh, of its contemporary colonial and geopolitical power relationships. And that's, I think, rare or unusual for medieval art, uh, medieval manuscript. In the context of the Oratory collection, it is the only manuscript that was written on parchment and the oldest item in the, in the collection of over 800 volumes of pre-modern and early modern rare books accumulated by two generations of the Otori family. Father and son, Keisuke and Fujitaro Otori, were members of the early 20th century Japanese political elite, each with notable diplomatic careers that brought them to Europe and the Americas. Taihoku Imperial University purchased the Otori collection in Japan and brought it to Taiwan around 1929, shortly after it was founded by the Japanese government. The title of Imperial University gave the institution high ranking status, equivalent to that of the most prestigious universities in Japan at the time, meaning that it received ample financial resources with which it built its newly established research library. Otori 299 first traveled to East Asia as part of an eclectic collection um, assembled by um, Keisuke and Fujitaro Otori 
Keisuke Ojita, uh, Keisuke Otori died in 1911, and Fujitaro Otori died in 1931. To give you a sense of their dates, um, they they both received Japanese peerages for their notable diplomatic noted diplomatic careers. And under the emperor, uh, reign of Emperor Meiji and his namesake Meiji Restoration uh, Modernization Movement, the elder Otori traveled to Europe and the United States to conduct surveys of industrial techniques and practices. And he later served as an ambassador, first to the Imperial Court of, first to the Imperial Court of China and then to Korea. The younger Otori followed his father's footsteps with a diplomatic career of his own working for the government general of Taiwan after the Japanese took over the island in 1895, before going to serve in locations as far flung as the Netherlands, France, Russia, and Mexico. In broad terms, the career of both father and son reflect participation in reform efforts of the Japanese government during the late 19th century and Japan's subsequent rise as a colonial power. As a result, the contents of the Otori family's um, rare book collection reflects these intersecting strands of colonial history, foreign service, international politics, and interests in foreign languages and literatures. So the work of Japanese rare book dealer and book historian Shigeo Surimachi provides further details as to the manuscripts, um, as to or the Otori manuscript movement um, in Japan. Uh, in his book dealing with um, and the Otori, Otori family's um, book collecting activities. Uh, so in his book dealing with a mo the modern history of rare book collectors uh, and dealers in Japan, Sorimachi recounts that the Otori family sold their collection in the late 1920s to Isedo, a prominent Japanese rare book dealer based in Tokyo and still in operation today. As a former employee of Isedo, Sorimachi details how the Otori family had frequent contacts with many book dealers in Europe, in Paris in particular, and how the Taihoku Imperial University worked with Isedo to acquire the Otori collection in the late 1920s. I think it, it appears kind of probable that in the first few decades of the 20th century, the manuscript changed hands very quickly as it made its way from uh, Europe um, to, from likely London or France, um, because the previous owners were English aristocrats, uh, one of the previous owners, I should say, and eventually became part of this, this founding collection for a prestigious colonial institute of higher education. Uh, and the um, timing of the <clears throat> the timing of the collection's acquisition suggests that the university acquired the manuscript um, and the oratory collection as a whole in order to build a collection appropriate for an ambitious institution and its new research library. Specifically, acquiring collections of rare book uh, acquiring collections of rare books of European provenance or otherwise for building intellectual prestige appears to be a major part of the library's development in the first five years after its founding. According to information from the NTU Library's Special Collections Department, Chosoburo Tanaka, a noted botanist who served as the library's founding director from 1929 to 34, oversaw the acquisition of at least seven major rare book collections, totally, se totally several totaling several thousand volumes ranging from Chinese and Japanese print volumes to titles on Middle Eastern languages and European literature. Tanaka eventually gifted his own personal collection of over 3,000 rare books, mainly herbiaries and other botany-related materials to the university library. While Otori 299 is the only medieval item among these collections, uh, the, other, uh, the other rare books also include seven incunabula, uh, such as a Otori 606, a 1497, 1479 copy of Pliny's Natural History, and uh, Philosophy F123, a 1495 copy of Boethius's Constellation of Philosophy with comment by Saint, commentary by St. Thomas Aquinas. As a parallel instance of the newly founded library's ambitions for gaining institutional prestige, recent research published in studies, the Irish Quarterly Review by W.H. Cow of NTU's Foreign Language and Literature Department revealed an arrangement in 1929, the same year um, as the acquisition of the Otori, Col Otori Collection, to invite the Irish poet W.B. Yeats on a two-year visiting lectureship at Taihoku Imperial University, 
Yates accepted the lectureship, which included an annual stipend that totals about 65,000 pounds or 70,000 British pounds uh, in today's currency um, and travel expenses. But he was unable to take up um, the position because his son had fallen ill. Acquiring, uh, acquiring the um, autori collection signified the university's ambitions for academic prestige. And the collection itself provides unusual but intriguing paratext for medieval literature. Specifically, we find that the more familiar bearings of medieval literature are reconceived as part of a larger narrative on cultural contact in East Asia and the consequent repositioning of cultural and educational status um, and you know, the re reposition of the cultural and educational status of a medieval manuscript. This is one of the key contexts into which Autori 299 has been reinscribed as a cultural artifact through its movements. It does not belong to a collection that is necessarily antiquarian or devoted to the preservation or curation of medieval manuscripts. Rather, it reflects a keen outward interest in sites of cross-cultural contact, contact, specifically colonial encounters. The major components in the Autori collection indicates a strong interest in contemporary and present geopolitical histories from the 17th up to the 20th centuries with particular attention to points of contact between East Asia and Europe. In the introduction to the descriptive catalog of the Atori collection, Michael Kivak of the NTU Department of Foreign Languages and Literatures notes that the Atori collection covers law, visual arts, religion, political science, military history, geography, alchemy, anthropology, sinology, missionary history, uh, among many other areas, um, you know, hence echoing the kind of diplomatic career and interest in foreign cultures of the Otori family. Uh, and there are titles in Latin, uh, in um, French, Dutch, and several other European languages. The NTU Library's other Japanese era, uh, colonial era rare book collections reflect, sim reflect similar interests in European intellectual history, uh, including the Tanaka connection that I mentioned before, uh, which um, and its you know, collection of incunabula that includes herbiaries and agricultural texts. I think most interestingly, the sub a substantial portion of the Autori collection is devoted to European interests in and perspectives on the culture and geography of East Asia including travel narratives about Formosa, the old name for Taiwan given by Portuguese sailors, uh, Japan and China. There are sizable numbers of volumes pertaining to, dealings, pertaining to dealings of the Dutch East India Company, its colonization of Taiwan from the 1620s onwards and subsequent expulsion by Chinese forces in the mid 17th century. Um, and there are also volumes pertaining to the activities of 16th and 17th century Jesuit missionaries in Japan. So that's our context for considering this, um, a bibliographic context for considering this particular medieval manuscript. The vo these volumes in the Autori collection suggest a particular interest uh, in, uh, as I was saying, cultural contact uh, between Asian, East Asian countries and European visitors who arrive for trade, enterprise, or religious vocation. Specifically, um, there were both Dutch and Spanish efforts to colonize Taiwan in the 1620s, with the Dutch building forts and trading posts in southern Taiwan and eventually driving out the Spanish in northern Taiwan. And there's been some really exciting developments in northern Taiwan, in the, specifically in the excavation of a former Spanish colonial monastery uh, in Ke near Keelong, a city in northern Taiwan. Um, and so given this context, um, Japan in, um, in the 1920s, when the um, Imperial University was founded, has now finds itself in now found itself in a similar position as its Dutch and Spanish predecessors, a colonial power taking over Taiwan, incorporating it into a developing empire and exploiting its natural resources such as sugarcane, rice, and bananas. Although this is more of an educated guess, uh, given that we do not have uh, this, um, do not have much evidence about the pedagogical purposes of the collection. Um, and you know, the idea that medieval books are items of prestige is not new. But in the case of the Autori, Autori 299, we find that this prestige building takes place as part of a colonial agenda uh, at an imperial university that emulates a westernized intellectual framework. 
as a sign of its authority over Taiwan, Japan, Japan did not impose did, did not impose only its own language and culture, but it imposed the same intellectual framework as other global colonial powers of its time. There was this, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and among other volumes in the Otori co um, collection, these kind of travel narratives, missionary accounts, and geographical descriptions, um, it I think it places. Um, Otori 299, and it's and it's the text that it contains in a position of representing Christian Western backgrounds of customs, morals, and social attitudes, especially because we have we're dealing with instructional texts. Texts. In other words, Otori 299 forms part of a literary historical dossier that establishes a cultural po profile of early modern um, European visitors to East Asia. Kivak also notes that many of the volumes um, contain marginal annotation in Japanese and suggests that these books were acquired primarily for the purpose of study than for monetary or aesthetic value. However, um, Otori 299 itself does not contain any Japanese marginalia. And it makes me wonder whether it, it was because it was such an outlier because um, due to its date and its contents that it prevented, um, uh, that this prevented it from attracting the same kind of interest and intensity of study as other volumes in the collection. So it's in light of these intellectual interests and bibliographical contexts that we need to consider medieval French texts that make up Otori 299. Um, the modern only known provenance reveals close, because you know, this provenance reveals close associations with Japanese colonialism, uh, we can position the, night, the Book of the Night of the Tower in Aesop's Fables as representatives of Western culture and education background or whatnot in the eyes of its Japanese owners. Um, and I think this suggests a keen interest in understanding the foundations of say, the uh, Western quote unquote Western mores as told through the exempla drawn from classical and biblical narratives um, that we see in the Book of the Night of the Tower, typical of many um, medieval European instructional texts, and the kind of Aesop's fables, these um, um, stories intended for primary education, fundamental you know, customs and mores. And also both medieval texts are concerned with uh, prime, like fundamental moral formation and the promotion of habits and conduct that institute good moral behavior. So you know, rather than being in the middle, so to speak, these medieval texts appear to stand for some sense of origin, of essence in both developmental and chronological terms. Having such a manuscript would, having a, such a manuscript would signify a kind of cultural acknowledgement or a kind of potential alignment with uh, the, um, uh, uh, these, uh, these mores and habits I've, uh, that I've referred to. It is not to say that these two medieval texts somehow explain the entirety of you know, medieval culture, uh, but rather it is to say that they are part of a comprehensive survey of the forms of knowledge, whether uh, more instruction or travel accounts that were taught, produced, practiced in European American countries. The medieval texts do not have other medieval texts as their immediate counterparts. Uh, that is, um, the context of the Yotori collection does not encourage reading into, for example, the medieval tradition of the exemplum or other elements of scholastic tradition. Instead, it makes available this, a new interpretive inroad, the participation of the Book of the Night of the Tower and Aesop's Fables in defining a broader cultural profile that looms large um, among uh, Western interests in East Asian culture and geography, and that perhaps figures in the self-regard of potential political figures like the Otori family. As far as I am aware, the Otoris have left no records regarding how and why the manuscript caught their attention, but their colonial diplomatic careers evoked the possibility that the manuscript represent an object of study as well as a badge of prestige. Um, since the manuscript alongside, um, appears alongside missionary histories, the pedagogical and morally instructive aspects of the medieval French texts become all the more underscored. The vastness of collection, the lack of records about the, precise, the collection's precise composition over the course of the lives of the elder and younger Tory uh, means that we don't know whether one item you know, was a companion or complement to the others. But 
um, except in kind of the cluster, the thematic clusters that I've mentioned before. Nevertheless, one wonders about the ways in which, as well as the extent to which, two morally instructive medieval texts are adjacent to morally instructive objectives involved in missionary work, especially in the Jesuit tradition. What impression does Western religious culture need to impart on East Asian audiences in order to bring about conversion, to persuade people to either to adopt either Catholicism or other Christian denominations as their faith? In other words, the two medieval French texts together perform a dynamic intersection between moral pedagogy and cultural contact to the extent of combining religious doctrine with form of social, forms of social custom in elementary education. In this way, we can read the manuscript as a kind of proto-colonial entity. The two texts represent one of many linguistic interfaces through which missionary teaching was conducted and in which um, these, you know, their influences could be exerted. So to conclude, I think I want to talk about some um, difficulties in the research process because this is a relatively new line of inquiry. Uh, the two medieval French texts take part through their presence in the 2299 in reshaping um, political and cultural identities. There's a great deal, there's a great deal of reshaping in the Middle Ages and Middle Ages themselves. Um, but the Japanese colonial history surrounding the manuscript's provenance and ownership throw such process into sharp relief and expands the notion of the kinds of uses and connections that these medieval manuscripts have. And it's because of this set of expanded connections that um, it comes with new research obstacles. Much of the bibliographic information that I've presented uh, and consulted um, and cited are currently only available in Chinese or Japanese. And in some instances I've had to, uh, I've only had access to machine translations or to paraphrases provided by rare book librarians. Uh, tracing the provenance and history of the manuscript required a disparate array of research materials and would not have been possible without the help of rare book librarians spanning 13 time zones on three continents. And I'm particularly grateful uh, for the help of Hong Wan Jun, uh, Hong Wan Jun at uh, National Taiwan University, Consuelo Dutchke, who is retired and, um, of Columbia University, and Lynn Ransom at the University of Pennsylvania. And I conclude on this note, not to sound discouraging, but to point the way forward to what I hope will be an exciting new lines of inquiry, uh, new lines of thought for medieval manuscript studies. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kelly Wing. And I'm coming to you today from Palo Alto, California, which sits on the ancestral land of the Ohlone and Wekma Ohlone people. And thank you to the staff and organizers of the Region Enmity Symposium. It is an honor to take part in this event and to contribute to a larger race before race initiative. I'm excited to share new research with you today, which developed from another project on classical reception within Vietnamese context. As I was investigating how French colonial administrators racialized the Gauls in relation to Vietnamese people in the early 20th century, I began to wonder if the Gauls had been racialized by the Romans. To be sure, ethnic prejudice against the Gauls was palpable, but was racialization also at play? And was it partially to blame for the fact that the forcibly displaced Gallic and Germanic groups were not recognized as refugees, either by Caesar or by his readers over the millennia. I can still vividly recall my first encounter with Caesar's Gallic Wars. I had a visceral reaction to Caesar's portrayal of some of these tribes as invaders to be vanquished, people I saw as refugees. Perhaps my own refugee background made me more sensitive to the wide ranging experiences of refugees, especially in terms of who gets granted refugee status, who gets to receive it and why. You see, even though I consider myself and my family refugees, we were not officially granted asylum by the US. We didn't quite qualify because my father, a former commander in the army of South Vietnam, had not been imprisoned long enough to meet the requirements. And we had not been able to escape, although we tried three times, during the first few waves of the refugee exodus. 
which saw over one and a half million Vietnamese people flee political, social, and economic persecution under the communist regime. And yet my family and I could not stay in Vietnam because we faced generational persecution for my father's quote betrayal. So what does it mean to be a refugee? What are the social, cultural, and political factors at play that dictate who is seen and treated as a, as a refugee versus other categories of migration? And what role does race play in the process of refugee making? As a case study to explore these big questions as it pertains to the ancient Roman world, I examine the racialization of the Helvetii, a Gallic people within Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars. I argue that by applying tenets from cultural refugee studies and critical race theory, we can uncover how Caesar draws on these deep-seated Roman entity towards Gallic peoples in order to racialize the Helvetii and deny them their refugeehood. Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars offers an especially illuminating case study because of Caesar's own supposed refugee lineage. The Julian line claims descent from Ulysses, otherwise known as Ascanius, who escaped the fall of Troy along with his father Aeneas and his grandfather Anchises. After wandering around the Mediterranean in search of a new home, Aeneas and Ascanius eventually conquered a new land on the Italian peninsula and became the prophesied progenitors of the Romans. Their journey toward fulfilling their destiny of founding the Roman Empire is famously memorialized by Virgil in his epic poem, The Aeneid. But before Virgil and Augustus, Caesar's nephew and the first emperor of Rome, capitalized on this illustrious heritage, Caesar had already begun promoting it throughout the quickly expanding Roman territory. For example, this slide shows a picture of a silver coin minted by Caesar in 47, 46 BCE. The reverse of the coin, the coin portrays Aeneas carrying the palladium in his right hand and his father Anchises on his shoulder as they flee Troy, while the obverse of the coin depicts the head of Venus, the goddess who coupled with Anchises and gave birth to Aeneas. This imagery thus explicitly conveys the origin, the refugee origins of Caesar's noble lineage. The trope of a refugee or exile founder was not an uncommon one in antiquity. Rome itself had several mythical refugee founders besides Aeneas and Ascanius, such as Romulus and Remus and Evander. According to legend, Rome's initial growth even depended on refugees and exiles who were offered asylum by Romulus, although the makeup of those asylum seekers depended on who was telling the myth. Forced displacement served as an effective rhetorical device to forge kinship ties and craft many other notable, uh, craft collective identities, a theme explored by Emma Dench, Catherine Edwards, Eric Gruen, and many other notable scholars. With forced displacement so central to the foundation myths of so many cities, including Rome, it would appear that the Romans, at least in theory, should be open to and accepting of refugees. Indeed, this has been the larger narrative of the Roman Empire, whose success, it has been argued, was due in large part to its successful integration of diverse peoples and cultures, a narrative that is especially pervasive with, within the public imagination. And yet, as the case study will show today, in practice, the portrayal and treatment of refugees varied according to how they would best benefit those in power. In order to identify refugees in Caesar's work, we need to not only peel back layers of rhetoric and propaganda, but we also to have to adapt a more critical understanding of refugeehood. The concept of refugees as a distinct category of displaced peoples developed in the mid 20th century in response to the overwhelming outpouring of European refugees in the post-World War II era. The 1951 Refugee Convention defines refugee as, quote, someone who is unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, end quote. Since this early definition, there have been calls to expand the definition of refugees beyond the contingency of persecution. The current UNHCR uh, definition defines refugees as, quote, people who have fled war, violence, conflict, or persecution, and have crossed an international border to find safety in another country, end quote. But this definition also falls short since it's restricted by contemporary geopolitics and the modern notion of nation states. For while the separate category of refugees did not exist in Greco-Roman antiquity, the phenomenon of forced displacement and the consequent search for refuge certainly did. Following critical refugee studies, or CRS, I understand refugees broadly as, quote, those who have been forcibly displaced from their homeland due to perceived danger and are seeking refuge outside of 
their resident community, end quote. CRS itself serves as a humane and ethical site of inquiry that reconceptualizes refugee life worlds, not as a problem to be solved by global elites, but as a site of social, political, and historical critiques that, when carefully traced, make a transparent processes of colonization, war, and displacement, end quote. Refugee life worlds from events leading up to displacement to attempts at resettlement and integration are therefore profoundly entangled with social and political factors. Refugees should not be treated as crises to be solved, but rather as a paradigm that can help deconstruct ne nexuses of power. Seemingly right on cue though, in the opening of the Gallic War, Caesar introduces the Helvetii as a crisis to be solved. He famously opens his account with Gallias omnis divisa in partis tres. All of Gaul is divided into three parts, inhabited by the Belgae, the Aquitani, and the Celts, or better known to the Romans as the Gauls. According to Caesar, quote, of all these, the Belgae are the strongest because they are furthest from the civilization and humanity of the Roman province. And traders least frequently go to them and import those things which tend to weaken minds. And they are closest to the Germans who live across the Rhine with whom they are continuously at war. On account of this, the Helvetii also surpass the rest of the Gauls in strength because they contend with the Romans in nearly daily battles where they either repel them from their own borders or they themselves wage war on their own frontiers." End quote. Having established the basic character of each people in accordance with how far from Rome they are, Caesar goes on to emphasize their barbaric nature and drive home how far from being Roman they are. He immediately focuses on the Helvetii, who are the first Gallic people Caesar and his army battle in his commentarii. Caesar claims that the Helvetii are, quote, omines bellandi cupidi men fond of waging war, and that this belligerent nature stirred them to find a larger territory where they are not fenced in by natural barriers or by Germans who are supposedly even more bellicose than they are. Downplaying the threat of the Germans to the Helvetii, Caesar instead asserts that the Helvetii are migrating because of their war-loving ways and their desire to conquer the whole of Gaul. Quote, it was reported to Caesar that the Helvetii intended to make the journey through the land of the Sequani and the Aedui into the frontiers of the Santoni, which was not far from the boundaries of Tolosates, a state in the province. If this were to take place, he understood it would be a great danger for the province to have warlike men, enemies of the Roman people, bordering upon places that were exposed and very rich in provisions. Portraying the Helvetii as a militant people who need to be contained for the safety of Rome and its allies, Caesar quickly establishes them as homines bellicosos populi romani inimicos, not just warlike men, but also specifically enemies of the Roman people. And yet, if they were indeed headed for the land of the Santoni, there was no real immediate threat since the Santoni were about 130 miles from the Roman province. This careful construction of the Helvetii as a people removed from the Romans in terms of place, culture, and nature in order to justify Roman aggression towards them is a form of racialization. For to racialize a group of people is to imbue innate traits that render them inferior in relation to a superior group with the intended purpose of oppressing them on a systemic level. Moreover, as Michael Olney and Howard Winnett have argued, racial formation is, quote, always and necessarily a social and historical process, end quote. Since the sack of Rome in 390 BCE by the Sinones, the Gauls have served as a sort of boogeyman, as people so different from the Romans and so unstable that by Caesar's time, they still posed a threat. Caesar draws on the socio-historical image of the Gauls an aggressive and dangerous people who, according to Cicero, were savage and bar barbarous, to further strip the Helvetii of their humanity and thus separate them even further from the Romans. He repeatedly recalls a specific, hum a specific historical event where the Helvetii defeated and embarrassed the Roman army. In fact, when the Helvetii sent an embassy to Caesar to ask for his consent to cross the Roman province without, any causing, without causing any harm, he replied, quote, Caesar, because he held onto the memory that Lucius Cassius, the consul had been killed and his, it, and his army routed and sent under the yoke by the Helvetii, did not think that it, their request should be granted nor did he reckon that men with hostile disposition should an opportunity of marching through the province be given would abstain from insult and injury. 
The fact that Caesar reports the Helvetii's request to cross through the Roman province is interesting because on the one hand, it showcases his authority, which is apparently so powerful that it also extended to these warlike people who clearly were deferring to him. And yet on the other hand, it undermines his claim that these dangerous people were planning a devastating invasion. Regardless of this contradiction though, the story and its link to a past injury builds on Caesar's rhetoric of defending the province to include defending Roman honor. Caesar calls on this historical enmity between the Helvetii and the Romans many more times throughout his account. For example, when the Helvetii tried to cross the Sun River, Caesar furtively attacked them in the night and celebrated the fact that he decimated a quarter of their number. According to Caesar, this quarter happened to be comprised of people from the Tigurani, a clan of the Helvetii that defeated Cassius and sent his army under the yoke. Thus, whether by chance or by the design of their mortal gods, that part of the Helvetian, Helvetian state which had brought a notorious calamity upon the Roman people was the first to pay the penalty. On account of this, Caesar revenged not only public injuries, but also personal ones, because the Tigurini had killed his father-in-law, the legate Lucius Piso, the grandfather of Lucius Piso in the same battle as Cassius. So once again, Caesar turns to past injuries to build his narrative of defense, this time extending it to the defense of familial honor. To battle the Helvetii then was to fight against invaders who not only posed a threat to Rome's allies, but also embodied a an old wound to the Romans and to Caesar personally. With these layers of threat of people so removed from Rome and the Romans, the causes of the Helvetii's own displacement quickly fade into the background. This deep-seated enmity is called upon for the final time after Caesar defeated the Helvetii, decimating over two thirds of their population of which only one fourth were fit for military service, according to his reports. Despite the fact that most of the people immigrating were not fit for war, Caesar continues to paint them as violent invaders bent on dominating all of Gaul. At the end of the Helvetian campaign, Caesar claims that leaders from other Gallic tribes came to him to thank him for repelling the Helvetian threat. Quote, when the war with the Helvetii was concluded, legates from almost all of Gaul, the leading men of the states, gathered to congratulate Caesar. They understood that although he sought vengeance in war from these people for the old injuries of the Helvetii to the Roman people, nevertheless, that matter had occurred no less to the advantage of Gaul than to the Roman people, because the Helvetii, while their affairs were most thriving, had abandoned their homes with this plan where they would wage war and gain control of all of Gaul and he, they would choose from a, great abund, from a great abundance a place of habitation, which they had judged was the most useful and the most fruitful of all of Gaul, and they would hold the rest of the states as tributaries. So throughout the scene, Caesar returns full circle in his rhetoric of defense as he emphasizes the threat that the Helvetii pose to greater Gaul. In addition, he also distinguishes the Helvetii from, the Gallic, from other Gallic peoples who are painted as more noble and more civilized due to their proximity to Rome and its culture. In their work on relational racial formations, Daniel Martinez Hosang and Natalia Molina argue that, quote, racialized meanings, identities, and characteristics are all, always constituted through relationships and are always dependent on a shared field of social meaning. They are never produced in isolation. Race is not legible or significant outside of a relational context. From that, from this perspective, Race does not define the characteristics of a person, instead is better understood as the space and connections between people that structure and regulate their association. To inhabit, claim, or ascribe, or be ascribed a particular racialized identity or grouping is to be located in an assemblage of historical and contemporary relationships." End quote. As we saw earlier in the opening of the Gallic Wars, Caesar right off the bat situates the Gauls somewhere between the Romans and the Germans, both geographically and culturally. This organization of the Gauls in relation to the Germans serve as a form of relational racial formation as it aims to categorize people for the sake of domination. While Caesar did not invent the separation between Gauls, Germans, and Romans, he did exploit it by repeatedly conjuring socio-historical prejudices. But he goes beyond distinguishing between racialized groups to differentiating within them. To separate the Helvetii, the supposed invaders, of Gaul's Gallic allies from those, from those very allies, Caesar compares them not only in relation to the Romans and the Germans, 
but also in relation to other Gallic peoples. Thus, Caesar opens up his work with highlighting their relatively remote location and their constant battles with the Germans, which caused the Helvetii to, quote, surpass the rest of the Gauls in strength, end quote. While this may seem like a positive trait, it is important to note that this strength is in regards to violence, which is the main imagery Caesar is trying to associate with the Helvetii. Due to this inter and intra relation, relational racialization, what emerges is a stratified social structure in which pe different peoples are judged according to their proximity to Romanness, Romanness, which itself is rather nebulous and elusive. So when the Aedui and the Allobroges, Gallic peoples whose territory border that of the Helvetii, but on the right side, away from the Germans and towards the Romans, sought refuge from the invading Helvetii, is no surprise that their refugeehood is acknowledged and granted. According to Caesar, these two people, quote, retreated to Caesar in refuge and pointed out to him that there was nothing left but the soil of their land. Prompted by these circumstances, Caesar decided that he should not wait until, after all the possessions of his allies had been taken, the Helvetii arrived among the Santones, end quote. Caesar has these people call on their close connection to Rome as a justification of why Rome should repel the Helvetii, and thus why he and his army should cross the boundaries of his dominion. For the Aedui were the brothers and kinsmen of the Roman people as decreed by the Roman Senate, while the Allobroges were a part of the Roman province. Socio-historical relationships between the Romans and the Aedui and Allobroges thus rendered them as more Roman adjacent and consequently as more deserving of aid. And yet, despite all that effort that Caesar put into painting the Helvetii as an innately warlike people, he ends up resettling some of them in the land of the Aedui, the very allies whom Caesar had just saved from the Helvetii. He resettles the rest of the Helvetii back on their land with the explicit reason that they provide a necessary buffer between the Germans and the Roman province. Moreover, after the Helvetii are defeated and the Germans become the new migratory danger, Caesar finally acknowledges the Helvetii's refugeehood. Quote, unless there was some sort of aid from Caesar and the Roman people, the same thing must be done by all the Gauls that the Helvetii had done, namely that they immigrate from their home and seek other, another dwelling place, other settlements remote from the Germans and try their fortune, whatever may come to pass, end quote. We witness a backtracking of Caesar's previous racialization and militarization of the Helvetii, which has recasted them as invaders instead of as refugees in order to authorize his need to cross further into Gaul. And now as he needs to justify his need to cross into Germany, Caesar aligns the Helvetii closer to the more Romanized Gauls and further from the, Roman, from the Germans who are the new racialized other. As Hosang and Molina have remarked, a relation, quote, a relational treatment of race thus conceptualizes racial formation as a mutually constitutive process. Racial meanings, boundaries, and hierarchies are co-produced through dynamic processes that change across time and place, end quote. All of Gaul does not appear to be simply divided into three static parts, but rather into multiple different ones in relation to their proximity, both geographically and socioculturally, to the Romans as well as to the racialized other. But that other shifted depending on the social and political context. Indeed, by Book 7, which records the events of 52 BCE, the Aedui, Rome's beloved kinsmen, the very people whom Caesar claimed to have defended against the Helvetii, only to then settle them in Aeduan territory, the, the Aedui become the invaders, spurred on by, quote, greed, anger, and rashness, which are, the innate, which are innate to that race of men, end quote. As we have seen through Caesar's changing rhetoric on who is and isn't a refugee, Rome's openness to different peoples dependent on the plasticity of racialization, of where different peoples fell on the racial spectrum of Roman hegemony. It is this plasticity, the organizing, reorganizing of different peoples and the control of their physical and social movements that was key to the growth and maintenance of the Roman Empire. Thank you. Great, thank you, Molina. Thanks very much to all of our panelists. Uh, those were really fantastic presentations. Um, at this point, uh, we should probably move into the open Q&A dialogue. 
And I'd like to invite all of our participants in the audience to continue contributing questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom windows uh, as, we, as we continue talking. Um, our first question is for Dr. Richardson. And uh, Ali Omara asks, what uh, you make of the use of the Romani child as functionally a sartorial accessory in a number of the iconographic images that you discussed in your presentation? So uh, Dr. Richardson, would you care to speak to that question? Thank you so much. And thank you, um, Ali uh, Omara, for the question. Um, I was actually hoping to hear, you know, <laughs> what some of you thought. I, I think they're just highlighting, um, I, mean, I mean, meaning the European artists are, are, are highlighting, I mean, the, the baby is always nude. That I mean, but I, I, I don't know what they're trying to convey as, but they are always mentioning, right? There are a lot of children unsupervised in these camps that we're seeing in you know, 15th century Central Europe. But as for how it's functioning, I don't, I would actually love to hear any other ideas. Um, I don't know if they're impugning parenthood or, I mean, of course, you know, the older children, the ones who can actually, oh, maybe you're referring to the ones who can walk. For some reason, I'm thinking of the babies. But of course, the older children who are, sorry, stealing um, coins from, from people's purses underneath their, their, their cloaks. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the implication, right, is that they're inheriting these very unchristian habits that uh, what they purport to be, they purport to be Christian. And yet, you know, we, we don't see this, not in the adult and, and certainly not in the youth, right? So it's not an accident. Um, so certainly again, with, with, the, with, the, with the, you know, older children, yeah, I can see that they're using this to say that this is, an, these are endemic behaviors. And for these reasons, right, conversion is not possible, right? They are kind of outside of the possibility of Christian salvation. So, so you're right to highlight that, Ellie, thank you. Uh, let me think about that. Uh, how, yeah, it, it feeds into the same argument. Thanks. Absolutely, and it, it really raises questions about the extent to which anything in medieval iconography is sartorial or can be considered as, you know, accessory or simply cosmetic in that, in that same way. Um, I, uh, I, I do want to uh, just swerve very briefly uh, to uh, a question of my own that I that was inspired by uh, by Dr. Ma's presentation, uh, which I was, I was I was quite taken by that. I thought that uh, in in a lot of ways, uh, Dr. Ma's presentation kind of models in some ways uh, bibliographic scholarship uh, in in, a, in, a, in an extremely fascinating way. Uh, there's, uh, you, you know, Dr. Moss sort of tracks the movements of this medieval manuscript through uh, these different historical contexts, these different times and places. And I, I guess the thing that I found most surprising is the extent to which the circulation of a, of a manuscript uh, participates in these national and these geopolitical ambitions. Um, I was curious about uh, how Dr. Ma, for example, in the beginning of uh, his presentation talks about how uh, Taihoku Imperial University in Taiwan Taiwan uh, pushed a lot of funding towards the acquisition of rare books and manuscripts of European origin in order to sort of build the intellectual prestige of a newly constructed research library on the campus of the, of the university. And uh, of course, uh, keeping in mind that these objects rarely, if ever, speak for themselves, I, I found myself wondering if, uh, you know, and this is a question for Dr. Ma as well as all of our panelists, if, if there are any other ways in which this notion of the prestige of a material text from the distant past or, or the aura of a rare book or a manuscript, are there any other ways in which this articulates with imperial or colonial projects? Uh, doctors R Richardson and Wen, for example, uh, do you see this operating as well in your own fields and disciplines? Uh, and, and are there ways in which these objects perhaps can subvert the geopolitical projects that they get conscripted to support in all these various ways. I guess I, I can start. Uh, so uh, thank you, Sylvester, for that, for that question. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. And I, it's something that I want to look into further because uh, there's so little 
information available at the moment. Um, and I, I want to do some digging, like contact the um, Japanese and um, rare booksellers on Isedo in Tokyo that are still in business to see if they have any records, um, as, as well as you know, lean on friends who can read Japanese and help me translate some uh, Japanese scholarship. Uh, but I think that there, 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 there are definitely uh, further venues and, and avenues for thinking about how a medieval artifact, a medieval manuscript can be, as you say, conscripted or you know, drafted in or might you know, take part in you know, more, uh, take part in colonialist uh, imperialist agendas. I think um, it, it's too bad that we don't have um, an evidence of how this manuscript was presented or um, how it was um, interacted with. Um, and I think it's very, I would say that its very presence at a imperial university uh, alongside other rare book um, acquisition endeavors, alongside the instance of trying to invite Yates to Taiwan, um, that tells us a lot about how you know, um, kind of European American culture were regarded, um, if not the books themselves, uh, but certainly European American culture were regarded as these uh, as a kind of touchstone uh, for uh, for um, higher education and for research. Um, and the, you can think about the, uh, both the colonial and the racial optics of that, uh, specifically how you know, Japan is, you know, is kind of taking these, you know, European, most European, most of the American, uh, say, you can say indications of intellectual, uh, intellectual legacy, prestige, um, and what, 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 whatever other words um, that come to mind. And they're using that to say, you know, this is what a university is look, should look like. This is what Taiwan colonized entity should have and imitate and even emulate in order to uh, in order to become part of the empire. Uh, so I, I don't have any evidence for the books themselves, but I think the entire kind of intellectual project of the whole as a whole of um, Taihoku Imperial University uh, speaks to uh, what uh, speaks to on um, these um, um, divergent avenues. I can hop in um, just going off of what uh, Dr. Ma just talked about, and this is in relation to my other um, research on classical reception in Vietnam. Um, what I what I found really interesting too is you know this cultural capital that comes comes with the classical tradition right and with the just a quick synopsis of what happens in colonial Vietnam is that the classical tradition gets. Um, imported into Vietnam in multiple ways, right? One was to justify the colonization of Vietnam by the French. Um, and it also was imported in another way in terms of um, the, the European missionaries who came to Vietnam and Latin became a common language between um, the different missionaries as well as the indigenous people. But what happened in the within the colonial hierarchy was this classical tradition carried this cultural capital, right? That I had just talk, mentioned that that it was used as this sort of gatekeeper to the colonial hierarchy through the education system. So the French kind of imported this um, education system that was based on the classical tradition. You had to pass Greek and Latin exams in order to gain entrance into these schools. And because these schools were made for the children of the European colonists. And if you can't get into those schools, right, then you couldn't climb the social hierarchy, couldn't get these coveted um, uh, positions that were not meant, you know, that weren't just reserved for um, the indigenous people there. And, but what I found, going back to your question, right, of, 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 of how, how, is there some sort of pushback that can be, um, that a pushback against this sort of, you know, just um, pristine cultural capital that is on a European scale, can we find some evidence of that? Um, there is, and in, in this uh, one example that I'll give you too is from um, Fatim Kim. He was the first Vietnamese classicist in the sense that he was the first Vietnamese person to get a degree in classics. Um, and he lived in the early 20th century. And he, at first, you know, he climbed through the ranks. He went through all these European schools, well-versed in the classical tradition, but it came to a point where he, didn't know if he could translate between these different 
cultures anymore. If he, he could translate between the, you know, the French and then their, their supposed um, uh, predecessors, the Romans, to then the Vietnamese and couldn't translate between cultures and different peoples. And if, if that was fair to the Vietnamese people and you kind of, how that kind of played out was in um, you know, some of his publications. So in his early publications of Vietnamese um, folklore, he would translate, he would use uh, references to, to different classical works, right? To try to make it more legible and palatable to um, his French audience. And he was writing in French. And so he'd make references to the Aeneid, for example. But then you could see subsequent um, publications of, this, of similar stories, he takes that out, right? And that kind of reminds me of um, what Aldra Simpson, anthropologist, talks about in uh, Mohawk Interruptus, she talks about you know the the, the um, ethnographic refusal, right? This this refusing to um, this refusal to be involved in these imperial pathways of knowledge production. I think that's a very powerful way, and we can see you know the silences of, um, that are very purposeful silences. Thank you very much, Kelly. That was really, really great. I think that uh, both your and uh, Dr. Ma's comments uh, really sort of highlight the extent to which the, the reception of text or the reception of a cultural object can be the site of both, uh, you know, sort of a nefarious geopolitical project, but also perhaps resistances to that very same thing. Uh, so so that I, I, I find that to be a great message. Uh, so, uh, sticking sort of uh, with the, the general theme of reception, just to uh, kind of, you know, uh, uh, align a thread between these, these disparate questions that are coming in. Um, we, we have a, a, a question for Kelly coming in from uh, Daniel Padilla Peralta. Um, and this question is, uh, how do you see racializing ethnography intersecting with the geopolitics of controlling population movements? Uh, uh, your talk uh, made uh, Dr. Peralta think of or, or regard the uh, ethnographic material in De Bello Gallico and the reception of that material in early modern contexts uh, in an entirely new in an entirely new light. And I think I, I'm thinking about it in, in kind of similar terms. So I was, I was wondering, uh, Dr. Nguyen, would you care to say a little bit to that point? Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Yes, and, th and thank you so much, um, Danelle, for your question. And I know that you're Zooming in right before your talk, so especially thankful that you're here. Um, yes, I, so the, the, the racial, not racializing ethnography intersecting with geopolitics, I think that is at the heart of what I'm trying to get at, is that um, population control, population movements can, it, right, in, uh, cannot be separated from these racialized ethnographies and from this racialization of different people. Um, I think that they're just so interconnected that you have to study kind of the two in tandem so that you, and you, and because of that, you can't take at face value what it is that, um, you know, how, how the people are being, these different people being moved are being portrayed, right? You can't just look at something as population transfer. What does that mean? Who, who is doing the transfer and how are they talking about these people? I think is are, are interesting questions that kind of get under what well, you know the, the their experiences beyond the fact that they were moved. Well, why were they moved, right? And how does that benefit and bringing power into play here? How does that benefit um, those in power, right? Because I think that's um, one of the I think with one of the key takeaways that I that I hope you all take from my from my talk um, is that identity and um, movement are inextricably interconnected. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nguyen. Uh, and uh, again, sticking with this theme of the, the controlling of population movements, sort of like the biopolitics of motion in a way, um, we, we have a question from uh, Owen Williams for Professor Richardson, uh, asking if Professor Richardson could say just a little bit more about the ways in which uh, the early Reformation complicated the Roma's ability to travel through Central Europe. The, the, again, the travel of the Roma is a significant theme in your presentation. So uh, do you think it required them to redefine or qualify their claims to be penitential Christians in a contested Europe? 
That's a great question, uh, Mr. Williams. Uh, you know, so after, right, so the, the first letters they get are for seven years purportedly, right, from King Sigismund and other princes, like local princes and, and kings of different kingdoms. Um, and so after seven years, you know, they actually go back, you know, to different, you know, to the same courts. Of course, there could be different, you know, potentates, and different rulers, but they do go back and, and say that they need another, you know, they're going to do it another seven years, um, that, they, that they need to redo their commitment to the faith. So it seems to have been, I mean, we can read it so many different ways, but but what is interesting is that they do keep getting, they keep receiving letters, uh, supposedly, um, but there is also some some vague suggestion that maybe you know some of these some of these letters because there's so many of them from some of the same king like King Sigismund you know <laughs> wrote so many that maybe some of these could have been um, forged somehow. But I mean, again, these are just these are just claims and counterclaims, but. Um, but what is interesting is in spite of, I mean, after 1417, um, I mean, right in 1417, right, the, the, the public opinion towards these pilgrim shifts so, so dramatically, even so, they continue to give them um, safe conduct letters. And, and you don't have, you know, phenomena of, of exile, et cetera. Um, I guess, do they change their claims? No, but they, they, they claim to be, you know, sorry that they did not live, live up to the expectations of their initial pilgrimage and penitent voyage so um i don't know you have a very you have a prejudiced audience and, and they keep they keep letting them come back so that's basically what happens <laughs> yes absolutely and the, and the ways in which displacement can be challenged can be reversed to uh are or, or is, a, is a consistent theme in, in another question that, uh, that is directed at, uh, at Dr. Nguyen, uh, also from uh, Dr. Williams. So thanks very much for your enthusiastic participation, Dr. Williams. Um, uh, and uh, asking if uh, Dr. Nguyen can speak a little bit more about the, uh, the Santones, the Santoni, the, the sort of enigmatic ethnic cultural grouping uh, that's, that's talked about in Caesar's Gallic Wars. Um, and uh, Dr. Williams is wondering if we have uh, independent accounts of these people and their movements through space, their historic lands, uh, or are they more just kind of a historical cipher that uh, is that are named by Caesar only to be displaced? Uh, would you care to speak to that? Yes, great question. So, yeah, we don't have much account of the Santonis, um, and they are really. I, besides the fact that they, you know, they live on the coast um, in Western uh, France, in modern day France now. Um, and so they're important for trade, right? They're very, they're, 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 they're important to Caesar in terms of trade and allowing him to use, um, uh, go through their lands and use the ports nearby. And so uh, they are strategically important to kind of keep um, in control. Um, and then in his later, um, Later in the Gallic Wars, they do uh, end up <laughs> revolting against him as well, um, and joining um, uh, joining Vercingetorix and his and the Gallic up Gallic uprising. And so, yes, they are kind of brought up to be like we need to defend them in much the same way that he brings up the Aedui, who have you know these fictive kinships with Romans, and he uses all sorts of um, rhetorical devices there to to make a case right for his um, for his campaign and for crossing the crossing his dominion the, the boundaries of his dominion, um, and it, and it's a similar thing here. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nguyen, for, for that uh, really fascinating and thorough response. Um, I, I think the, the point about the, uh, I, I'm sorry, I need to look up the, uh, the spelling of this, the, the Santonis, the Santoni, uh, the, this account of, of how the, uh, this particular ethnic or cultural grouping is handled particularly uh, in Caesar's Gallic Wars made me think about the extent to which uh, you know, the, the relationship of biopolitics and movement, you know, pop, the movement of population groups through space is, uh, is, you know, from various points in history, it's kind of a top-down thing in a lot of ways. It's, you know, it's institutionalized. Racialization is something that happens from the top down. And I, I, as, as somebody with literary training, uh, as particularly 
particularly in the Renaissance, I'm, I'm curious about the extent to which individuals themselves can, can have a stake in perhaps subverting or, or resisting uh, these broader sociocultural processes. And I think that uh, in a lot of ways, uh, my, my interest in that notion is, is kind of inspired by, uh, by Dr. Richardson's talk in a lot of ways. There's, there's, uh, there's this, uh, um, excuse me, this anecdote uh, as, uh, surrounding um, the, uh, the, the, the subjects of your talk, uh, specifically Duke Michael of, of Egypt, um, who, who seems to employ the artifice of self-presentation in a way uh, as this distinct mode of being in and moving through the world. Like, like Duke Michael uh, sort of presents himself as being kind of a Christian penitent or a, or a wandering pilgrim. And, and you talk about the extent to which that gives him a kind of mobility in a sense, the, uh, the ability to kind of cross uh, geographic boundaries in, 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 uh, in unique ways and in, 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 uh, sort of new ways. And, um, and uh, I'm curious about the ways in which Duke Michael is able to sort of use this kind of self-fashioned identity to sort of subvert the forms of biopolitical control that are operative in medieval Europe at this time. And I thought that was, there's, there's a lot of uh, at least interesting potential there, at least for me. Um, and I'm curious uh, about whether there are resonances between this sort of distinct cultural phenomenon and the context of, for example, Dr. Ma, Dr. Ma or uh, Dr. Nguyen's research, you know, uh, in what other ways does the sort of self-fashioning of identity enable movement across these disparate cultural boundaries? And in, in what other ways can the artifice of self-presentation uh, perhaps even subvert racializing logic and the biopolitical control of cartographic space? Um, uh, so this is a question for all of our panelists, but I invite Dr. Richardson to speak first because I'm curious about what you think. That's a great question. I have to say, I mean, as a historian, you know, I was I was really impressed with the ways in which um, not just Dubai, but certainly him, because he was the first, he was the earliest record we have, right? And then there comes Count Andrew, and there's Thomas, and there, you know, there are a lot of people who follow him. Um, I think there's a Vladislav, um, but that they're really keyed into social structure, like they're they understand power and they understand. You know, cultural prestige so well. I don't know exactly their facility with the language, right? That doesn't come up until the 16th century. Do you have people saying, oh, they're, they, they don't speak whatever language so well, they speak another language, but you know that he makes himself legible through language, through status as a, a duke, right? Um, through his subjects, um, through his Christianity and his penitence. I mean, he really creates a, a, a space around his, um, around his group. But what is also striking is, you know, when they go to these various towns in what is today Germany and France, you know, they they live outside of the city. They, they, they camp, I should say, outside of the city, outside of the walled city. And so they have this privacy. They have, you know, they can be themselves. So they're not always performing for this um, eventually disdainful public. So I, I did admire how he was able to fashion privacy, even, you know, in for people who don't have, you know, fixed domiciles. Right, they're they're camping in tents and things like this. Um, so, th I I actually feel like that that's quite ingenious. I mean, it's it's just really. Um, and, but other than that, yes, I you know I also see it. I want to hear you know how the other panelists are also working through these ideas in their own work. If it's mobility of of objects and books, if it's mobility of of you know entire ethnic groups, right, um, displaced by war. You guys are thinking through that, but but that's a great question, Sylvester. Thank you. I can I can jump in and say say something quick. If that's okay. Uh, the uh, Sylvester, that's a really interesting question. And um, and um, Dr. Richardson, thank you for that last bit of thinking about mo mobility. And I think that's what it's quite unusual about this manuscript that I examined. That it's it's so rare to see a medieval manuscript be so mobile. I mean, we we of course have lots of medieval manuscripts in North America, but this is a completely different trajectory uh, that crosses a different set of continents and I think cult cultural boundaries and barriers. And it makes me think about how uh, the idea of mobility and self-description um, or uh, self-identification as in relation to book collecting and 
and connoisseurship, how uh, this collection of books, the Otori, uh, like the Otori collection in which this manuscript is, um, is a, uh, can be found, um, how book collecting and connoisseurship builds a kind of representative profile, we want to say literary, historical, otherwise, for, um, for not only the uh, book owners themselves, but also a kind of a, we can say, a kind of uh, traveling companions for its constituent um, items. Uh, and uh, so I, I think that that aspect of self-description as part of book collection is a is, is kind of a pivotal process here because this is how it's it's through these diplomats on their kind of foreign uh, missions um, on their kind of this kind of um, imper imperialist and imperialism agenda of Japan of modernizing westernizing uh, that's how the book collection emerges. It doesn't emerge from, uh, say, a, a cathedral, a cathedral library, or a you know, nobleman's collection, as we see many medieval manuscripts kind of emerge from. This the survival, I guess you can say, of this medieval manuscript comes down to uh, comes down to a diplomatic and imperialistic uh, uh, movement and um, and mobility, even uh, that. Brought this book into and brought this book to East Asia and entirely renewed its context uh, for whether you want to say prestige purposes or uh, or otherwise. Your your question of you know how for the individual and the individual racialization and how that self fashioning. Um, of the identity could enable movement. I, it's, it's a much more difficult <laughs> question to answer. I think in the looking at um, materials from the Roman Empire in terms of self-fashioning identity, but you know, turning to what we have in, um, for example, in C Caesar's Gallic Wars, it's interesting to see how he fashions. I mean, this is not so self much self-fashioning, but Caesar kind of. Uh, creating a sort of self-fashioning in his speeches that he gives to um, to different Gallic leaders, right? So in book one, for example, there's um, uh, Dewey Kiakis, who is uh, one of the leaders of the Idui, right? And so he he has him fleeing and coming to Caesar, and he he throws himself at his seat at his feet as a suppliant, and he the way that Caesar has this man fashion himself is as a leading man of the Iduin, and he is um, a refugee asking for Caesar for help, and he is a noble person because he specifically states, you know, I, everyone else had to make this oath that they, um, and give hostages and make an oath that they wouldn't, um, you know, go against them, or go against these invaders, but I didn't make an oath, and I came here running for you, and so there's like the, uh, you know, and this is early on in the book before he then paints the Idui in a different kind of way, right? Because there's, it, right now it's useful for him to kind of paint the Idui as these noble people, as kinsmen of, of Rome, um, who are, who have even similar, you know, who've developed similar values as the Romans, right? And because they have these kind of similar values and they can be kind of Roman adjacent in this way, we can give them help, right? And so, the, and they're deserving of help. And so it's kind of also interesting to see, you know, this like, fashioning of this of of individuals um in this very political way and and using you know like individual movement in this way as well absolutely and i, I think that the extent to which uh yeah, racialization and uh, sort of from the outside of the individual racialization sort of impacting the body, particularly in the context of your research, Dr. Nguyen, uh, is uh, it, 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 it seems to me as though, you know, sort of moving backward from the individual to the larger population group, uh, it seems as though that particular process is in some ways useful for the formation of a Roman identity by Caesar. And I think that uh, we, we have a question from uh, Christine Johnson in the audience uh, for Dr. Nguyen, uh, to, uh, something to this effect as well. The association between racialization and violence in Caesar's text is fascinating uh, for Christine because the Romans are also engaged in this sort of expansionist violence. So um, uh, just sort of uh, moving to the end of our Q uh, Q&A discussion here, I wonder if uh, Dr. Nguyen and uh, perhaps uh, the rest of our panelists too, if they if they have thoughts on this topic, 
um, I might speak a little bit about how racialization and violence articulate racialization helps to position uh, Roman military actions in ways that are useful for the definition of a broader cultural identity. Um, uh, so would you care to speak to that uh, just a little bit? Yes, um, thank you so much for that question. Uh, it's the association between the two in it also inextricable right there's the, the it's um i think the racialization of these different peoples and this kind of goes back to daniel's question too um is kind of this justification right of for violence and it's a it's a justification on both sides both for why these people are invoking violence and why they are violent people and why we need to use violence to kind of quell that down um and you know it, it's 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 uh, a rhetoric I think that is then replicated through time has started even before then this rhetoric of, of sort of like a just war right like what is a just war what is you know for the U.S. we can also look at in terms of more contemporary politics right um, and then let's use the Vietnam War since that's how I began my talk of um, you know what make, trying to make a justification for U.S. involvement in Vietnam is it was a justification of you know bringing freedom and democracy and fighting against communism but once that war was lost and there was a huge exodus of refugees then the justification kind of shifted right and and there was um then you look at a lot of the critical refugee scholars work on this for example um in le spiritu or mimi te wing or um so many but they're, they're they talk about you know the the justification of the of the US involvement in Vietnam shifting once there was this huge movement of people outside of Vietnam and and trying to um you know trying to escape um escape persecution the the justification kind of shifted then to well we didn't bring freedom to um to the country but now we're bringing freedom to them as they come to us right and it became sort of this justification for us involvement of, of what in the spirit to kind of calls a we win even though we lose kind of rhetoric right of the us is still able to um help and still able and still able to justify us involvement because of the opportunities they're giving to refugees now and that's why the refugee narrative is so powerful um and, and the refugee narrative of who gets to receive asylum is so powerful and so um you know so so tied in with geopolitics because now we look at central america they're not being um people who are being forcibly displaced there they're not being called at, as refugees referred to as refugees and they're not being given asylum um right we, we hear all sorts of different terms for them for them and so i think they're you know it's important to kind of think about the power of these terms and that because they're not neutral and and think about the power of those terms um, and how we can kind of uh, upset and kind of disrupt, you know, our understanding of it um, from early 20th century, um, you know, world wars kind of geopolitics. Absolutely. And thank you so much, Dr. Nguyen, for, for speaking to, to that question from the Q&A. Uh, at this point, uh, we have run out of time for our Q&A dialogue, but thank you so much uh, to all three of our panelists for those excellent uh, presentations, uh, as well as an excellent uh, Q&A dialogue. Uh, at this point, I would like to hand the mic over to uh, our own Maite Green Mercado uh, to start us off with some closing remarks. So thank you, Maite. Thank you. I'm actually going to turn uh, the microphone to Ana yes. Laguna. Somehow my video, I think, needs to be enabled. Uh, I cannot turn. OK, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. So the fourth edition of Race Before Race closes with a revitalized and expansive scholarly song one dedicated this time to the examination of two engulfing vectors of early modern geopolitical and imperial projects, city and region. Over the past four days, we have learned about the multiple ways in which race making in the pre-modern world was tied to processes of empire building and colonial projects. Yet we have also seen um, how race making could also exist outside of structures of states and empires. 
Examining these processes diachronically and across uh, di uh, different geographies, we have also learned how the crafting of religious minorities into racialized groups served as blueprints uh, for the classification, management, domination, and exploitation of newly subjected populations in new theaters of colonial and imperial expansion. Through this expansive lens, we have explored the Mongophobia of Imperial China, the added layers of against Islam in Java, and the racialization and genocide on ancient strong Western frontiers. We had to return to the conceptual horizons of antiquity to understand the complex anti-Jewish impulses of Christian expansion in late Imperial Rome and beyond. From the festive Christa Christmas sound of a Biancico, New Mexico, to the deathly blows of mass murder in Manila, we have learned how the pervasive codification of racial difference can encourage and enable mass violence against a wide range of perceived others, be they Africans, Jewish, Mongols, or Moriscos. The non always amicable relationship of East and West was also illuminated today. We became aware of how a Roman general could erase from his text the suffering of those racialized refugees left behind by his military campaigns, how medieval sources could bolster Japanese colonial ambitions in Taiwan, and how biblical stories of sanctuary and calamity associated with Egypt could shape Northern European ideas into essentialized representations, identities, and regions. Many of the presentations have also invited us to consider the close nexus between religion and race, and the ways in which religion in its theological and legal dimensions shaped racial discourses and practices that justified the domination and control of populations. We saw, for example, how accusations of unbelief could serve as legal justifications for enslavement. And we also saw how soteriology could serve as an argument in favor of slavery. Um, according to this logic, slavery could be a valuable vehicle for salvation. We have also learned how ideas of perceived difference, feelings of superiority, and also enmity were articulated through a language of barbarism and civilization. Thus, assigning irrationality, volatility, rage, wrath, and unbelief functioned in different contexts to subject and to extract labor from those deemed inferior. We would like to thank the authors, all the authors of these insights and all the sponsors that, that made their explorations possible. The Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies and the College of Arts and Sciences at Arizona State University, the Hitz Foundation, the Folger Shakespeare Institute, the Center for Cultural Analysis at Rutgers University in New Brunswick. We also wanna thank the Department of English at Rutgers University, Newark, the Department of World Languages and Cultures at Rutgers University Camden, the Department of History at Rutgers University Newark, and uh, the Department of English at Rutgers University New Brunswick. And to everyone uh, watching and taking part in this Race Before Race conversation, thank you very much for being with us today. <laughs>